At 18 years old, I had a massive stroke. At uh, age 22, my mother called me fat. I was 90 pounds heavier than I am now. At age 24, I had major abdominal surgery. I'd have been dead at the ends of my 20s or 30s or at least had heart surgery. You know, I was fortunate. My plantation patients, my patients taught me the truth. Hello and welcome back to the Goodness Lover Show. Today we're joined by Dr. John McDougall, who is a board certified internist and author of 13 national best-selling books. And he's here to talk to us about carbohydrates and why you actually might need more of them on your plate. It's a very lively and controversial discussion. So let's jump in. Dr. John McDougall, it is wonderful to be with you today. Uh, You're a legend in this space. You have no less than 13 national bestsellers. You've been running the McDougall program. What is it for like 35 years? Is that right? No, I've been been doing that for, yeah, for 35 years now. 35 years. So our published results show that we get nearly 90% of people to reduce or stop their medications. Uh, especially blood pressure and blood sugar medications. Now, <clears throat> one of the independent studies done on our, our work was done from New Zealand, which is uh, one of your neighboring countries. And uh, what they did is they took a community in a town in New Zealand, and you go to my website and you can find this study. It's, it's there available for you to read in its entirety. And they took this community of people and they put them on the McDougall diet. And they get the same kind of results. <clears throat> they got a 25 pound sustained loss in weight, sustained for a year. They got a uh, 20 point drop in cholesterol, sustained for a year. And about 80% of people continue to follow the program after a year. I mean, these are results that are unheard of in medicine to get people to comply like this. The reason they comply so well is because Number one, they get such phenomenal results. They get off their drugs, their bowels get working, their chest pain stops, their arthritis goes away, but they also love the food. Mm-hmm. We have the most delicious diet there is. Uh, it's made up of what we call comfort foods, traditional foods like mashed potatoes and pasta and marinara sauce and bean burritos and uh, and sushi uh you know, Chinese or Japanese vegetable dishes put over rice. You know, it, it's, it's, it's a familiar meal plan, especially to cosmopolitan people who've been around the world and tried different ethnic diets. And that's what we use. We use foods from all around the world. And we get these phenomenal results. Again, they're published in the scientific literature for anybody to read. Just look up Dr. John McDougall. They're there. Mm-hmm. And these are uncontested results, by the way. Incredible. So we that's what I do now. Uh, but it, it wasn't always that way for me. Uh, I'm a, a regular medical doctor. As a matter of fact, I'm a board certified in, internist. I'm an adjunct professor at a university. I teach medical students. I, you know, work as a clinical professor. Uh, so it's a very, very legitimate practice. It all started about about a half a century ago. And I'll tell you, you know, seeing you two, uh, I assume you're good friends at least. Uh, <laughs> Sometimes. It reminds me of the relationship that I've had with a very special person for the last 50 years. And uh, so I would have to say the program started when I met Mary in an operating room in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, she was a nurse. Uh, I was a medical student. Uh, we... Uh, made our declaration to each other back 50 years ago, and we moved to Hawaii. In Hawaii, I got my basic education about how to practice medicine on the big island of Hawaii, working as a sugar plantation doctor. Now, a sugar plantation doctor, you might have guessed, works uh, in, a, in, a, in a plantation that produces sugar. Well, its workers are primarily made up of Chinese, Japanese, Filipinos, Koreans, that have moved from their native land to Hawaii and started a new family, a new life. Well, <clears throat> these first generation people, they stayed on their basic diet, which was centered around rice. I mean, think about it. What do the Filipinos eat? What do the Japanese eat? What do the Chinese eat? Koreans, Vietnamese, rice. 
So their diet was over 90% rice and a few vegetables, almost no meat, no dairy. And these people came to me and they were my patients, but they never got sick. Uh, they stayed trim, hardworking in the fields until their 80s and 90s. They raised their families. Now their kids who were born and raised in Hawaii were influenced by the American diet. We have Texas Drive-In right up from the plantation I worked at, which is the home of the Malasada, which is a greasy donut. So they started, they started eating the richer foods. And well, even when I was there, uh, a monumental thing happened. And that is McDonald's came to Hilo, Hawaii in 1974. I, that was the first McDonald's on the island. I was one of their first and best customers. <laughs> anyway, uh, we, I had this, these three or four generations of people. Those who were first generation who lived on rice Second generation, more Western influence, like the diet you eat in Australia and New Zealand and the United States. And by the time you got to the third and fourth generation, they were fully Westernized. They suffered from obesity, gout, breast cancer, colon cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, and so on. They were just like the, the patients I learned medicine on when I was a, uh, a medical student in Michigan or a resident in Honolulu. You know, these were... I hate to use the word, but they were fat, sick people. That's the second and third generation. But the first generation wasn't who lived on their native diet of rice and vegetables. Anyway, after three years as a sugar plantation doctor and having great experiences, I caught 100 babies. I did brain <laughs> surgery in the middle of the yeah. night. <laughs> but most importantly, I learned my limitations as a doctor. You know, my patients never got well. Those with chronic diseases never got well. And like most doctors, all I did was give them a, a handful of pills and a bunch of excuses. They never got well. Well, that was very frustrating as a physician. So I went back into training after three years as a sugar plantation doctor, and I became a board certified internist. And what I discovered is a basic truth that I want you to understand. And that is the rich Western diet makes people sick. It has made people sick for at least 5,000 years. If you go back to the pharaohs, to the kings and queens, to the pyramids, to the hieroglyphs, and you find mummies that are 3,500, 4,000 years old, they suffer from Western diseases. These are, are kings and queens that never smoke cigarettes. They got lots of exercise, lots of sunshine, but what they ate was they ate the food that was brought to the temple. What, 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 the, what the, uh, the people, the common people who lived on wheat and barley did is they would kill some animals and put them on the statues and then the priests and priestess and kings and queens would eat the animals. And they got fat and sick, just like the royalty of, uh, of the 1800s in Western Europe. I mean, can't you picture the fat king sitting on his throne with his gout inflicted foot? Rich foods make people sick. The traditional diet of human beings is the diet 99.99% of people have followed. The traditional diet of human beings was given up about 50 to 100 years ago. The traditional diet is reflected in, for example, the diet of Aztecs and Mayans. These are known as the people of the core and these people of Central America, their civilization has existed for 1300 years the people of the corn. The American Indian ate the people ate corn. The, the people of South America, the Incas lived on potatoes. If you, if you go to Europe, you go to the Middle East, you remember that this was called the bread basket of the world. And if you think of Asia, you probably come to the conclusion that these people eat rice. Before 1980, 90% on the food of a typical Asian's plate was white rice. But that's changed. I mean, people in Asia are rich now. Like for example, the Chinese are some of the richest people on planet Earth. They have the second greatest number of Tesla supercharger stations in the world. And you look at the Chinese people, look at the rich business Asians. They look just like Americans and Australians and New Zealanders, right? Okay, so with that basic knowledge that there is a diet for human beings and that is corn, potatoes, rice, sweet potatoes, beans, peas, and lentils, and rich foods that most should be consumed on special occasions. 
Like, for example, <laughs> you have cake and ice cream on your birthday, right? Mm -hmm. on, on Thanksgiving, you have turkey. At Christmas, you have you have ham. And on, I, you know, Australians, New Zealanders, and Americans, they have a birthday party every day after lunch and dinner. <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. Thanksgiving is the healthiest meal they eat all year long. We celebrate every day with one feast after another. Why would you think we're sick? Anyway, that's the, that's the underlying basic foundation for what I wanted to tell you. <laughs> that's quite an, that was quite a, like a National Geographic way of getting there. I loved it. I was, I was with you well, the whole journey. Can you see it? Can you see what I'm yeah, talking no, about? I, I can see it. I'm curious. Yeah, there's so many ways, pathways we could go down, but to start with, is there any proof that our digestive tract um, does well with these, uh, like a rich carbohydrate diet? Oh, absolutely. Again, that was the traditional diet of people. Almost everybody who's walked planet Earth has eaten a starch-based diet, a diet on rice, corn, potatoes, and so on. Plants, only plants have fiber in them. There's no fiber in any animal product at all. You've heard about how fiber is integral to the health of the intestinal tract. Fats, okay, if you lack fiber, you get constipation, uh, which is associated with inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. You also, you also get diarrhea from the same diet. And we can go into that if you want. Uh, the, the, the animal products, uh, that's where you get the cholesterol. Cholesterol is only found in animal products in any significant amount. And, and this cholesterol is absorbed through the gastrointestinal tract, and then it uh, becomes embedded in your arteries. It gives you heart attacks and strokes. So anyway, we, we take, I would guess that 80% of the people that I take care of at my clinic, remember we run a telemedicine clinic. People from all over the world can get involved. Yeah, very inexpensive. I would say 80% of the people have bowel problems. Mm. And uh, many of them don't realize it because uh, they think a normal bowel movement is a rock hard fecal marble. Can you understand that? Yeah. <laughs> Can you relate to that? A rock hard, rock hard fecal marble. Well, I'll <laughs> tell you, you know, at, at the clinic, this used to come up a lot. Is I ran this clinic at a resort in Santa Rosa, California for 18 years. And the people who ran the resort, when they knew we were on the schedule, they would order extra toilet paper because all of a sudden people would have normal, large, easy to pass, non-stressful, non-bloody bowel movements. What a pleasure. This happened in about two or three days. Now, uh, surprisingly, on the other end of this discussion is I take care of an occasional person with chronic diarrhea. In fact, diarrhea to the point where they can't even get out of their bathroom. They have their iPad in their bathroom. They have their phone in their bathroom. They haven't been to a meeting in two or three years because of distress that would interrupt the meeting with diarrhea. They're afraid to get on an airplane because of the diarrhea. Well, this is easy to explain. What happens when you eat fat? We're talking about vegetable fat, you know, healthy fats, olive fat, pig fat, cow fat, any kind of fat, fish fat. What happens is you produce bile acids in the liver, which are to digest the fat. Well, in certain circumstances, like people have the inability to reabsorb bile acids or they've lost their gallbladder, or they have other diseases of the small intestine, particularly the distal small intestine, the ileum. What happens is they can't reabsorb the bile acids and they end up in the large intestine where they're so irritating that they result in 20, 30, 40 watery explosive stools a day. Well, Andreessen, and you can find this on my website. In fact, I'm gonna give a lecture on fats and so on up here soon. You can find it on YouTube. It's gonna be a two hour lecture. But Andreessen published in the early 1970s in the journal Gut, how he took people with this inability to reduce bile acids in their intestine, people who, these irritating bile acids went into the large intestine, people who had 20 on average, bowel movements a day, watery stools. He put them on a starch-based, low-fat diet. And within 48 to 72 hours, they were forming two to three formed stools a day. 
because they stop the irritation of the bile acids, which are produced by the fat people eat. And you know the Western diet's a high fat diet. So, you know, as I say, the, the treatment of bowel disease is extended as far as deadly diseases like ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. The research says so. These diseases are only present in populations that eat the rich Western diet. You know, anyway. <laughs> well, where would you like to go from here? Gallbladder <laughs> disease, bad breath, <laughs> stinky well, <I'm> farts. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was thinking something a little bit more controversial. Perhaps uh, grains have been vilified, and uh, there's been enormous controversy around this 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 topic. So I'm very interested uh, to see your passionate response. Um, obviously, uh, what we're building towards something that you've studied and researched and implemented your entire life. That have, you've obviously seen great results in people on a high starch, high carbohydrate diet. So tell us about grains, the controversy, and what you think of it. Two billion Asians lived on a diet of 90% rice up until 1980. Excuse me, how much nonsense do I have to put up with? You know, the idea that carbohydrates are bad for the bowel is contrary to not only the scientific research, all the scientific research, but geographic observations, historical observations. How did these Mayans and Aztecs ever survive? How did they compete in athletic events? How did they go to battle on a diet of corn? And you know, the, Ast, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the Incas, uh, not, not only are they potato eaters, they have 400 different species of potatoes in the Andes. But what happened when the, uh, the Incas went to battle because potatoes were so heavy to carry, they switched to a diet of quinoa another grain. Uh, yeah, you know, this, I'll, t I'll tell you what I, what I think is people like to hear good news about their bad habits. So anybody that comes around like me and says you shouldn't be eating a, a brie cheese or, or uh, you know, cow's butts or, you know, pig's feet, you know, they get real defensive. Tell me some, tell me something, some good news about my bad habits like grains are bad. Oh, then I can't eat anything or I can eat everything. You have a bunch of people who are, uh, are disingenuous as far as the truth is concerned. They've got a whole bunch of conspiracy theories. Hey, you ever heard of those? Uh, they, they ignore science. They, they, they uh, talk to the gullible population. I'm sorry to offend your, your listeners, but they're in big trouble. Half of them will die of heart disease. One in six women will get breast cancer. One in seven men will get prostate cancer. These are due to eating the diet of kings and queens. So maybe I'll hurt a few feelings. Maybe I'll offend a couple of people. Boy, if we got somebody to really listen to this message, you get, you get phone calls you wouldn't believe. As I say, our, our results are published in the scientific literature. We get nearly 90% of people to reduce or stop their medications. We get an average, we, we, there's a study uh, in PubMed about our work studying 1,703 people, nobody excluded, we got an average weight loss of 3.1 pounds in seven days of unrestricted eating. We got an average drop in cholesterol of 22 points, which is about four international units in seven days. We got, uh, we got about, uh, as I said, we got most people off medications. They felt great too. Their arthritis went away, their headaches went away. They had great bowel movements, which I know you enjoy talking. Now, that's one of the subjects I can get my grandkids to listen to us when we talk about bowel movements. They're at that age. So I'm <laughs> glad to hear that you like to talk. you like to do grand grand grandkid talk. <laughs> um, so if uh, just to conclude, I guess, the topic on grains, uh, could you tell us a little bit about the literature that we have on grains, obviously, um, there would be some uh, voices in in uh, the medical uh, community, wellness community, that would say grains are inflammatory. But what does the science say? What does the literature right. say? Well, this may be a little complex, but I'll, I'll try and help you understand this. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> again, people love to hear good news about their bad habits, and when you sincerely extensively condemn what they're eating, they have to find another explanation, a conspiracy theory. And what the conspiracy theory is, is well, 
it's not the meat. It's, it's not the dairy or the ice cream cones that's causing my problems. It's something called inflammation. And so we have to stop eating inflammatory foods. Well, inflammatory foods are the animal foods and the oils. What happens, the way, way you get inflammation, let's talk about this, is you start with injury. Like, for example, if you smoke cigarettes, you injure the lungs. The lungs respond by something called inflammation, which is the only way the body responds to injury. It, uh, the tissues become red and swollen and painful and hot. That's inflammation. That's not the problem. The problem is the source of injury. So you go to somebody and say, I got, I got an anti-inflammatory drug like corticosteroids. Take those, them for your lung, your lung problems. Rather than say, quit smoking, which is causing the injury. And it's the same thing, even though the, the advice is absolutely useless to blame grains as inflammatory foods. Instead, what we need to do is focus people not on the inflammation, which is secondary to injury, but on the source of injury. And what do you think the source of injury is? It's the food. And too often it's the foods that people don't want to talk about. You know, they're favorites. So they blame it on something else, which is untrue. Inflammation is a consequence of injury. What is the source of injury? You know, if you drink alcohol, you get inflammation of the liver. What do you think you ought to do? Take vitamin pills that help the liver? Or do you think you ought to stop the booze? It's the same thing with all this nonsense that you're being taught in terms of uh, a whole variety of diseases, all the way from cancer to heart disease, being due to inflammation. You need to ask, what's the source of the injury? Is that a too complicated of an explanation? Oh, no, no. Does that make okay. sense to you? Yeah, yeah. Somebody says does. inflammation is the cause of your problem. You say, next, next guest you have, you say, what's the source of the injury? Like, for example, when you smoke cigarettes, it causes inflammation. Mm -hmm. Should I give the person aspirin, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents, corticosteroids, to attack the inflammation? Or do you think I should stop the injury, the smoking? Mm -hmm. I guess that, um, uh, the same voices I, I mentioned before would say that grains is the source of injury. What would you say specifically to that? Is there any scientific literature to back that up? No. In fact, I did a whole article called Smoke and Mirrors of Grain Brain and, uh, and the Zone. I think it's the Zone. It's in one of my newsletters. Mm -hmm. And it goes through the various research. I mean, you guys are, you guys are hosts to an important blog. Do you ever look up the science to see whether a guest is lying to you or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You do? Okay. Well, then you go to my uh, website, drmcdougall.com, and you look up Smoke and Mirrors of Grain Brain. Okay, uh, and what you'll find is I've listed for you the bulk of the scientific research that shows clearly animal foods are inflammatory and vegetable foods, including grains, including wheat, are not inflammatory. Read the science. Mm -hmm. mm, you're being, you're, you, know, I, you, you really ought to be mad because you're, you're <laughs> being been given so much misinformation i i guess i'm i'm feeling that from other guests well ladies oh, and no, gentlemen no. Oh, no, no, we, we just like to give um so there'll be people that would object to what you're saying so we just want to give all right so you, you want to be the, the devil's advocate yeah yeah we want to give you the opportunity to defend that because there would be people saying well where right. is the evidence where is specifically john the evidence that animal the, foods the, are the evidence the is in the national library of medicine which is available to all of you for free and I bet you in 15 minutes, you can see what I'm telling you is true. Or like I say, you go to my website, drmcdougall.com, and you can see the newsletter I did on the smoke and mirrors uh, related to grain brain and the zone and all these other low, low carb diets. They're lying to you. Why are they lying to you? <laughs> well, it's called conspiracy theories. You know, uh, you gain a lot of audience, a lot of people who are, uh, are deniers of science to buy into conspiracy theories. We see it in politics, we see it in medicine, we see it every place. You know, this is emotion that people are reacting on, not, not science. Interesting. So I'm curious, you, you're now an educator in the medical field. Um, 
we know that uh, the average medical doctor, um, I think this is coming out of the United States, doesn't receive a lot of nutritional training. Uh, why do you right. think that is the case? Well, because medical schools, remember I'm a professor at, well, probably four medical schools. Uh, medical students come to me. The, the, and, and the students, when they come and they see what happens to people when we do something basic, which is to stop food poisoning due to animal foods and oils, they see them get well right in front of them and they go, why were we taught nothing about diet therapy? And they're not. They're taught nothing about dietary therapy in medical schools all over the world. They may, uh, they may be taught some biochemical formulas related to food, but not diet, diet therapy like I'm talking to you about. Well, the reason is, is because medical schools are trade organizations. They're, they're there to teach the students a trade, like to do eye surgery or bone surgery, uh, to a trade. They're, that's what they're there for. And they're there to get the students to pass the medical boards. That's why they're there. So that's why they get virtually no education on nutrition. I, I did uh, kind of a landmark thing. I did it in the year 2011. You could go to the internet and you could look up uh, California SB 380. It's a law that I wrote. I'm not supposed to say I wrote it, but I wrote it. And I testified uh, to two bodies of senators. And when I originally walked in, they said, we don't want to hear any more about uh, regulating doctors or making rules for doctors. And I gave them a 45 minute discussion. And within a month, both the major and minor houses of legislation in the state of California passed SB 380 unanimously. And Governor Jerry Brown signed SB 380 into law in September of 2011. Now, SB 380 forces medical schools, at least in California, to teach nutrition. And I didn't ask them to teach the Atkins diet or the McDougal diet. I just asked them to teach students about what human beings eat. And also SB 380 was supposed to force our 500 hospitals in California to have seminars, new time educational opportunities that, uh, that focus on human nutrition. Because as you said, Matt, clearly this is not taught in medical school. Medical schools are there to get you to pass the boards and to learn a trade. Interesting. So, um, okay, great. And that, that's a really interesting story, by the way, of um, actually talking to the senator. So mm. good job on that. Um, <laughs> so, okay, what are some of the, like, we have a lot of people in our community that are suffering from, um, you know, some form of obviously bowel irritation or something or gut issue. So with your program, I'm just curious to hear some stories of people that um, perhaps have, you know, uh, you know, had this diet or, you know, gone down this pathway of going more carbohydrate rich, um, which may be against conventional thinking about how to approach that. And what are some of the stories that you've encountered of people that have been able to turn their life around because of this well, particular you know, way? I've, I've got, I've got oh, more than a hundred stories mm -hmm. on my website, drmcdougall.com. They're called Star McDougallers. And there are people who have ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, constipation, chronic diarrhea. You know, I, hey, let me ask you something. If you're talking about bowel diseases, where do you think first? Don't you think about the things that come in contact with the bowel? It's just like if you had a lung problem, wouldn't you think about the breath you took in? Or you had a skin problem, wouldn't you think about the lotions you put on your skin? Why is it somehow that we become completely deaf and blind when it comes to the idea that when you put food in this 38 foot long tube, that it has nothing to do with health? How, how can we deceive ourselves and, and fail to look at the food as the cause. Uh, the human being is a starchivore, a starchitarian, a starch eater. As I told you, 99.99% of people who have walked planet Earth have consumed starch-based diets. The exception has been a few people who have lived at the extremes of environment like the Inuit Eskimos. So, uh, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't like uh, 100 billion people be uh, some evidence that you'd look at? Interesting. <laughs> so, yeah. um, I mean, no, I like you the cute look If it wasn't there. for the politics that occur in the United States, Australia, New Zealand, the rest of the world, 
I wouldn't believe what I just said. But you see people all over the world lying, having alternative facts, conspiracy theories. That's, that's the world of 2021. Mm -hmm. The better you lie, the greater the audience you attract, especially if you tell lies that support your listeners and their viewpoints. But it's not true. It's not true. I mean, you are people of history. What did what did ninety what did ninety percent of Asians eat up until nineteen eighty? Why was there the change in nineteen eighty specifically? Well, because of CNN news. You see, what happened when we had all this telecommunication is people said, "Hey, I want to live like Americans." I'm going to eat like Americans. I'm going to drive like Americans. But you know what? Most of these people end up being smarter than Americans and harder workers than Americans. And they have surpassed the American standard of living. But the problem is, is they didn't take some important lessons from history and save themselves from epidemics of obesity, heart disease, diabetes. You know, in China, for example, uh, you can find this published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in China. Uh, prior to 1980, 90% of the food was white rice. And before 1980, people lived on a diet that was 90% white rice. Today in China, more than 12% of the population is frankly diabetic, and half are pre-diabetic. And it's worse among the youth. The older people are still maintaining pretty good health and trimness, but the kids have gone hog wild. That's probably the bad thing to say, hog wild, and it was adopted the American diet. Well, you know, we need to be smart. We need to take advantage of san sanitation, immunizations, good nutrition. We need to take advantage of that and our hospital systems and the drugs. We have accomplished some amazing miracles out there, even recently with the COVID-19 vaccination and the the efforts to make the world a safer place. Science is dominant. Well, you know, you, you, you don't have to throw out the vaccinations, the sewage system, you know, the, the, the truth about nutrition, which you'll find in the National Library of Medicine, uh, just because you're rich. I mean, you can drive a Tesla and still eat a bean burrito without meat and cheese. <laughs> 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 so, um, <laughs> what? Come on! Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> um, oh, it's just like any question I ask. I know that you're gonna like you go down some really interesting pathways. Well, okay, so, Matt. It's I'll so tell you entertaining. What I, I, this I is enjoy, the I'm first time it. I've been around the block. <laughs> <laughs> so these rising chronic diseases that we have, that you, so your, your central thesis being that. Our departure from starches and eating more animal products, we have now had uh, obviously this chronic has followed this chronic rise in diseases, um, and yeah. obviously then there's all this confusion around diet, and so people don't know what to eat, so they just go back to eating what they want to eat anyway. So that's what the people do, yeah. Yeah. So I'm no, just curious. Nothing safe to eat. I might as well eat what I like, right? Yeah. So the, these biggest killers like heart disease and strokes, um, for example, just let's go into the mechanism as to why a, um, carbohydrate, a carbohydrate rich diet or a high starch diet impacts those certain diseases. Is, is it just the reduction of cholesterol or is there something else no. going on? No, there are other things going on. In fact, the only way to honestly, truthfully look at it is you have to say rich foods damage the arteries and cause them to close down through ruptures. Of plaques that give you strokes and heart attacks. I mean, you can't be any more specific than that uh, and still tell a true and complete story. Uh, there are all kinds of mechanisms involved in, uh, in heart attacks. The most common theory has been the cholesterol theory. The idea that cholesterol is toxic to the artery linings and causes injury, particularly oxidized cholesterol. It's called LDL cholesterol. Uh, it causes injury of the arteries. The other, the other thing that's come out as a recent theory is trimethylamine, TMA, TMA trimethylamine. Uh, this was discovered at Cleveland Clinic. Uh, researchers published, started publishing this about five years ago. What they found is that uh, people who ate diets with high levels of precursors of trimethylamine, which are carnitine and choline, 
which are found in animal foods. What happens is, and you have to, along with it, eat a uh, American diet. If you eat a vegetarian diet, you don't grow bacteria in your colon that have the ability to convert trimethylamine, TMA, into trimethylamine oxide, TMAO. TMAO is also known to be toxic to the artery linings. The other thing involved has to do with blood clotting. You know that you take aspirin to thin the blood, fish oil to thin the blood, so you don't get a blood clot, which is what happens when you have a heart attack. You get a sudden rupture of a plaque. You get a blood, a blood clot. Well, saturated fat causes the, causes the blood to want to clot. So there's another mechanism. It sets you up for, uh, after a rupture, to have a big clot form to give you a, a dead brain and dead heart muscle. So, I mean, there are three mechanisms right there that are dominant, and easy to research, and, you know, but, but the only truth is, is that rich foods will kill you. Yeah, rich foods will, no, no, it doesn't kill you. Rich foods make you live like a king and a queen, overweight and sick. Not very long. They don't kill you right away. You see, that's the problem. It's slow death. You know, if, if smoking a cigarette caused everyone to end up on a ventilator, nobody would smoke. If drinking alcohol caused people to get into an auto accident every single time they drank and kill their kids, nobody would drink alcohol. If eating one hamburger or a bowl of ice cream or a cheese sandwich closed your arteries down immediately, nobody eat this garbage. But because it's slow, you have to do it for, for 20, 40, 60, 80 decades to build up an accumulation of injury that finally tips the body over into death and disease. The body wants to survive. Its goal is to live, to survive, and it's in good health, so it does everything it can to survive. And the only reason the human being is alive today in Western society is because of this innate ability to survive and to heal extensive damage. We live in a miracle. You know, think about it. You can smoke two packs of cigarettes a day. You could drink a half a bottle of whiskey a day and you live. You can even eat pork chops and live, <laughs> at least for a while. But I guarantee you, you know, not many people are as, in, in as good a health as I am in my mid-70s or my wife Mary in our mid-70s. Now, I wouldn't have been that way. I started out a very unhealthy man. I told you about my plantation experiences. Well, prior to that, I lived in a family where my parents thought the most important nutrients were calcium and protein. So they made sure we got lots of milk and meat. The result was, is I had terrible bowel problems when I was a little kid. I'd be embarrassed to tell you about some of the things I had to go through to evacuate my bowels. I had terrible stomach pain. I ended up having my tonsils removed, which is due to the dairy, when I was seven years old. Uh, at, uh, at, as, a, as a young teenager, I had a greasy face and acne, and I was always at the, at the back of the pack because I had no endurance. At 18 years old, I had a massive stroke, a massive stroke when I was 18. And that was because of the way I was eating. I didn't kill me, but for 56 years, I've walked with a horrible limp. And if I ever went windsurfing with you, you'd note that I do terrible port jibes because I have profound weakness still on my left side. At, at, at uh, age 22, my mother called me fat. I was 90 pounds heavier than I am now. At age 24, I had major abdominal surgery. I'd have been dead at the end of my 20s or 30s or at least had heart surgery. You know, I was fortunate. My plantation patients, my patients taught me the truth. And so, as I say, Mary and I, uh, in our mid 70s, approaching our 80s, <laughs> you know, you can hardly believe it until you reach that age. Uh, we're in great shape. We do everything we want. We really enjoy our seven grandkids, and uh, I stay active, and I get the opportunity to be on shows like yours, man, Sarah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for our very enlightening conversation, and we've actually had a lot of fun listening to oh, all I the hope different... you did. Yeah, we <laughs> had, definitely have. So if someone wants to learn more about you and the work you do, um, what's the best place to find you? Well, if you want a casual look, which, by the way, has all the answers. You go to our website, 
which is drmcdougall.com. That's D-R-M-C-D-O-U-G-A-L-L. -L. Or just look up John McDougall. I'm, I'm pretty dominant in the, web, in the internet. Uh, as if you just want to have, well, you can do it on your own. Everything's there. It's free. Everything is free. But, you know, if you're, you're facing uh, a real need to change, I mean, you've just had it. You're tired of asking for seatbelt extenders when you get on an airplane. <laughs> you're tired of going to the, the extra large dress sizes. You're tired of all that. Then let us have a chance to help you. You know, the telemedicine program costs a third of what we used to charge for our residential program. You know, it's almost a gift uh, that we have people come through this program. It's 12 days of intensive education and support. As I told you, our medical doctor is there, our medical doctors, uh, our support specialists are there, our dietitian, our psychologist, our exercise. The whole team is there for you. In two days, we start a new life for 50 people. And as you'll read from the study of my work that was done at Oregon Health and Science University, the medical school in Portland, is 85% of people stay compliant with the McDougall diet for a year. That means they're permanently changed. That's independent research. I didn't have any, any input into this finding. 85% of the people who follow who learn the diet stay compliant for at least a year. Well, thank okay. you so much for your time and um, be sure to check out Dr. McDougall's website. All it's right. great. You've got so much free information and um, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, well, it's fun. Obviously, you guys uh, are starting out in life and you, you want to not only have a good life for yourself, but the people you know and you know, to help other people is the greatest gift there is. And you must get a lot of positive reward from running this kind of show from your, your listeners. So I hope I contributed. And Thank you so uh, much. At least, at least got people thinking. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. McDougall. Well, that was controversial. Just how we like it, actually, here at the Goodness Lover Show. So if you would <laughs> agree, disagree, hated it, whatever it was, or loved it, please let us know in the comments. We'd love to hear from you guys particularly what specific point you agreed with or disagree with. That's yeah. how we'd love to get feedback on the show. And uh, make sure you like and subscribe because if you want more controversial things that like mm -hmm. we talk about, um, then yeah, like and subscribe. That way we know you love us and you know we love you and we'll keep making good content. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll do our best. But yeah, I really enjoyed today's chat. I couldn't stop giggling. It just made me laugh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> laugh the whole time so i had to keep it together um but yes uh we definitely respect him and his work yeah for sure, for sure. and it was just um certainly his, his personality shown through and i really enjoyed that yeah so. we did he definitely his goal was to get us thinking and get us thinking he did so let us know what you think in the comments below so thank you for joining us once again and we'll see you next week <laughs>